Hello! And welcome to Slate Money, your guide to the business and finance news of the week. I'm Felix Hammond of Axios. I'm here with Emily Peck of Axios. Hello, hello. With Elizabeth Spires of Slate and New York Times and stuff. Hello. And we are going to talk about Boeing this week. We're going to talk about safety and what the hell is going on with door plugs flying out of airplanes in midair. We are, of course, as promised, going to talk about the relative merits of Apple Maps and Google Maps. We are going to talk about Bitcoin ETFs. You can now buy spot Bitcoin in a box on the stock market. Is this a thing that matters? I think I'm going to enter into a bet with Emily about this. If you have ideas for the stakes, let us know. We have a long and convoluted Slate Plus segment all about Bill Ackman, which if you're a Slate Plus member, you will either listen to or not. And it's all coming up on Slate Money. This episode is brought to you by Splunk. You need to keep operations humming around the clock, but potential disruptions are everywhere. Splunk helps you predict problems and find and fix issues fast so you can reduce risk and ditch downtime. The world's largest enterprises rely on Splunk's unified security and observability platform to become more efficient, resilient, and innovative. With Splunk, you can react quickly, evolve faster, and be ready for anything. Stay ahead of disruptions. Learn more at splunk.com slash resilience. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the credit card created by Apple. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that you can now choose to grow in a high yield savings account that's built right into the wallet app. Apply for Apple Card now in the wallet app on iPhone and start growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility requirements. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. So I think we should start with Boeing and Alaska Airlines and this whole 737 Meshuggah's Redux. Elizabeth, what the hell is going on? So there's a thing called a door plug on a plane that's basically... The plug where they would have an emergency door, but they don't need one. And so this is a thing that gets installed during the manufacturing process. And there was an Alaskan Airlines flight where the door plug, I guess, blew out of the plane. Landed in someone's backyard. Yes. Um, There was some like 15-year-old kid whose shirt was literally ripped off his body as the plane depressurized. Total number of fatalities, zero which is good news. Total number of plane groundings, a couple of hundred. My take on all of this is that it's actually weirdly, paradoxically, an indication of how unbelievably safe air travel is. That, like, compared to the enormous number of preventable deaths that happen every day on the roads, in hospitals, and, you know, elsewhere, air travel has this incredibly elaborate and expensive and well-oiled machine with no blame investigations and things do go wrong like that's statistically inevitable but you know it's pretty much the safest even with all of these things that go wrong it's pretty much the safest thing you can do in the world like it's a lot safer than crossing the street right i i was saying i think to you earlier felix this week I was learned a bit more about how regulation of the auto industry works for an episode of What Next I did recently. And to keep it really simple, regulators in the US examine the safety of a car after it's released and only if there are problems does does the car get a look. But it's the opposite kind of process for an airplane, which regulators are looking at ahead of its release. Although we and we can talk about more why Boeing is getting through these <laughs> these regulations with with problems. But I mean, at the end of the day, that's why there are so many more fatal car accidents, or partly one of the reasons, than there are commercial airline fatalities in the U.S., right? There hasn't been one in, what, over a decade? I, I don't think there's been one this century. I mean, it's been a while. 
Yeah, I think part of it is that, you know, airline accidents loom so large in our imagination, partly because yeah. they're so heavily the plot points of a lot of the fiction and media we consume. There's so many movies about airline crashes and, you know, problems with airlines. So we, we are sort of more afraid of this incredibly unlikely scenario. And you couldn't do the same thing with cars because everybody has to, most people in the U.S. have to drive pretty regularly. Car fatalities are background noise, you know, to us. I think that's what enables, we are an anti-regulation country. The way we regulate auto safety is kind of like, yep, that's the U.S. for you, I think. But that's not tolerable in the, in the airplane space because of what Elizabeth is talking about, which is this heightened fear of, I mean, you're flying in a plane. It's terrifying. If you think about it for two seconds, nothing below you, et cetera, et cetera. It's very scary. And that's reinforced by, you know, shows like Lost or um, Yellow Jackets or whatever. <laughs> and that that means that in the U.S., we allow for and tolerate this very high level of regulation in this at least this one area. I think that's right. That there's there's a weird form of like all of this comes in some way from from public buy-in, right? And if you look back in history in America, like any attempt to make anything safer, whether it's the introduction of seat belts, the introduction of speed limits, making, you know, safer streets in cities, and uh, you know, mask mandates, all of these things run into almost immediate vocal opposition. And you find a whole bunch of people like calling into radio shows and saying, safety culture has run amok. We've gone too far. This is, you know, the country of freedom. And air travel is the one place where you don't hear that, right? When 200 737 MAX 9s get grounded overnight because of an accident and a whole bunch of flights are canceled, you don't get people calling into radio shows and saying safety culture is running amok. You get a little bit of grumbling about, oh, no, my flight has been canceled. But no one thinks that we've gone too far. Yeah, no one's like, put me on the 737 MAX 9. I'll risk the the door falling out of the sky. That seems fine. Like, this is a nanny state. Let me die on the plane. Like, no one's saying that, which is actually surprising. <laughs> <laughs> Can we now talk about Boeing and like, oh my God, WTF Boeing. First of all, they had a plane called a MAX 8, which we know was involved in two spectacularly fatal crashes back in 2018 and 2019. And that led to the plane being grounded. It led to their stock price tanking. It led to their CEO leaving. It led to big hundreds of millions, maybe, yeah, no, two and a half billion dollar settlement with the Justice Department. Disaster. First of all, the next step they take is to name a next generation plane, also the Max. Don't understand that. Well, there's there's the Max Seven, Eight, Nine, and Ten. They're all like just different types of Max. Just stop. Take it out. No more Max. I, I first <laughs> I don't understand what you're doing. Like if if I maybe they should call it the Min. Sure, Min. Anything else? I don't know. The super safe. <laughs> so first, don't do that. And second, this is so bad. Like. <laughs> This company really screwed up safety once before, and now they've gotten it wrong again. Like, how are they making it through this? Should they make it through this? So there is, th this is super fascinating, right? There is a global duopoly, basically, in airline manufacturers. There's Boeing and there's Airbus. And every so often, you know, the Brazilians will come along and say, we have one too, you can use our planes too. And then every so often people will be like, oh yeah, those Embraer's, they're great. But basically... You have two choices. And I don't think that, and you know, some airlines prefer one, some airlines prefer the other, but what they all prefer is having some kind of choice. I, I don't think anyone wants to be in a world where there's a global Airbus monopoly and the only choice you have is Airbus. So that really puts them at a, I mean, a company that does this twice, and I, and I guess, Felix, you're kind of implicitly saying it's not that big a deal that this happened, but it obviously is an incredibly big deal that this happened, that the door plug flew off and that, you know, this this plane was flying through the air within. Well, I, I guess I am saying that it's like, you know, if you compare if you compare what happens to Boeing planes to what happens to, you know, Tesla automobiles or something like, you know, they're not being held to the same standard. They're held, being held to a much higher standard, which I think is good. I think other people should be held to a higher standard, too. I'm not saying we should lower that standard. But I am saying that on some level, 
Boeing is is too big to fail. We need them to be building planes. That doesn't seem ideal, right, Elizabeth? I mean, we can't have a too big to fail airline that's bad at safety. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I think the people people are rightly pointing out that if the door plug issue is an, is somehow emblematic of a problem of sloppiness in manufacturing, then that's that's a larger issue because when people have been trying to investigate the source of this they always come back to the manufacturing process. And if there's a flawed manufacturing process, that's that's something that affects all of Boeing. This isn't an outlier. It could happen again. Uh, and it really is dependent upon that, I think. Well, I mean, I think, I, I think specifically speaking, given the way that supply chains work, it's, it's like, what's the name of the company that makes the door plug? I can't. It's Spirit. The name of the company is Spirit, and they used to be part of Boeing, but Boeing spun it off, a part of its, you know, play to to be profitable and to please Wall Street, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And so, yeah, so what you have, and this is true of, you know, any manufactured item anywhere in the world, right? There's there's almost no company on the planet that has, like, some fully vertically integrated manufacturing supply chain, right? So you're always going to be relying on third-party vendors to make large chunks of bits and pieces of whatever plane you're putting together. And an absolute core part of your job, if you're Boeing or Airbus, is to have incredibly strict controls and complete visibility into what your suppliers are doing and how they're doing it to make sure that they comply with your safety standards. And I feel like that is one of the hardest things about any modern manufacturing process is to get that like visibility into your suppliers and into people who aren't you. And obviously it is possible, right? Like we had that whole episode on on semiconductors, right? The semiconductors are all made to just insanely high tolerances and have incredibly long and convoluted supply chains and every single manufacturer along that supply chain has to work to the absolute highest standard and it works out right and if tsmc can work with asml then i don't see why boeing shouldn't be able to work with spirit but somehow it just seems to be harder i don't understand why yeah i mean i think we're still i mean the investigation is just getting underway and it's going to take some time to figure out exactly what happened another thing to note is that this door plug exists because they wanted to make only one plane, essentially. They wanted to be able to make planes and you could kind of like retrofit them to your needs. So you could have more seating in them or less seating in them. And you put the plug on, you take the plug off, you put more seats in, you take more seats out. That's another sort of cost cutting measure. I think that's also a safety measure, to be honest. How would it be safer though? Because just Intuitively speaking, if you want to ensure that if you're basically making one plane, then you're making sure that one plane is safe. If you're making 15 planes, you have to make you have to have 15 different types of like assurances that each of those 15 is safe and one is more likely to fall through the cracks. 15 planes because it's it's more like a you're you're building a body and then a separate part and these things are interchangeable like Lego so it's really whether the configurations are safe and not one base part. You want one platform and then you you make sure that the whole platform is safe. And I think that makes sense. Like I, I, intuitively that makes sense to me and it does seem to be safer. And intuitively there there should be sort of safety economies of scale, you know, on some level that trying to ensure that the first plane is safe costs you billions of dollars, but then the 10th plane should cost you just a couple million dollars because you've done all of the hard work already. So it kind of makes sense why we have a duopoly because like the upfront costs of developing a new airliner are so absolutely enormous. And then once you've developed it and once you've made sure that it's safe, it should be relatively cheap to make sure that each subsequent plane just is in accordance with the standards you set for the first one. You know, now it seems that you have like some workers who aren't tightening the bolts enough on the plugs and you're like, what? How does that even happen? When Peter Coy's piece in the New York Times, he mentioned two possible theories, lack of experienced employees because of COVID era furloughs. A lot of people didn't come back who knew what they were doing. That was one 
one reason, which I thought was kind of compelling. And the other was lack of motivated employees because COVID changed employee motivations, which I thought maybe was a little less compelling. Do, do we know when that plane was manufactured? It was, it was very new. It was, it was like three months old. It was, one of, it was a, basically a brand new plane. Yeah, it's a really new plane. I, I kind of, the lack of experienced employees and the change in the way people work post-COVID is really kind of intriguing to me. And we've seen more train derailments recently as well. And I don't know, I, I, I think there's something there. I, I will say that if you're trying to tighten bolts from home, that, that <laughs> we should take a break, have some ads, unless you're a Slate Plus member, in which case you get to whiz through the ads, not even notice them, they don't even exist. And instead, you can have more time to listen to us talk about Bill Ackman at the end of this show. But we'll be back with the best <laughs> segment of all after this, which is Apple Maps. Do you think airplane pilots use Apple Maps or Google Maps? Oh, I, wouldn't that be amazing if Apple, <laughs> if, if, if you like peeked inside the cockpit and there was there was the the airplane pilot and you had like Siri saying, "In five hundred miles, turn right." <laughs> so, Emily, in terms of personal finance, how do you think about my top tip, which is don't make sacrifices, Felix? The first thing I think about your tip, don't make sacrifices, is what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm saying that a lot of people really stretch themselves. They're like, if we give up this and we give up that, then we'll be able to afford, you know, a nice house, a nice car, private tuition for our kids, something like that. And it feels like a trade off worth making. And my financial top tip is don't do that. Don't give up the pleasant things in life, in life for something which you think is one big important thing. If you stay within your means and you don't have to worry about like every penny, you're just always going to be happier. But you're really, you're not saying don't sacrifice. You're saying don't stretch. You're saying, I'm saying both. live within your means. Yeah. If you're stretching, that's a sacrifice. You're giving things up. I think I agree with that. Don't stretch or sacrifice so that you can live within your means and spend money on all the little pleasures. So you're not like a Susie Orman, don't go out to dinner and don't ever buy coffee outside the house kind of a kind of a guy. Exactly. Go out to dinner, buy coffee outside the house, leave room in your budget for the little things because the little things add up. Spend lavishly on the little things and economize on the big things. I think that's my tip. Slate Money is sponsored this week by SAP Business AI. I've got some bad news. It won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia. It will identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks. It will automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. It's basically something that allows you to get ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. Okay, so thank you all for the amazing emails you sent in on Apple Maps versus Google Maps. There was a surprisingly large amount of different stuff to unpack here. But I'm just going to come out and say, Emily, because I read the emails, that you have been pretty much vindicated. Yes, yes. Apple Maps. People like Apple Maps for this much of the same reasons that I kind of uh, glommed onto when I used it for the first time just last week. And it was because they're intuitive. The, the way the Apple Maps lady, I guess it's Siri, the way Siri Apple Maps lady gives directions is really intuitive and so much better than Google Maps. Instead of saying, in 200 feet, turn right. Apple Maps lady will say something like, after this stop sign, turn left at the next stop sign, which is a hundred thousand times better way of giving someone who's driving directions. Because in the 200 feet turn right scenario, I'm often like about to turn right into someone's driveway by accident or, you know, whatever. It's just not as precise. And it reminds me back when before we had GPS and we had maps and people had to give you directions if you were going to someone's house for the first time. And like, the variation, the variety of the, of the directions really was astonishing. And, and there's some people were really good at it. Like, you'll see the Shell station on the left. So, you know, after that, the next light, da-da-da. And then some people gave just the terrible directions, you know. 
And Apple Maps just gives the good intuitive stuff. So this is the first thing which I want to note is that there was a bit of a difference um, between people who, when they're talking about maps, are talking about maps and people who, are, who, when they're talking about maps, are talking about driving directions. And I think that one place where Apple Maps is clearly superior to Google Maps, certainly in the United States, and I'm probably going to say in most of the rest of the world as well, is in driving directions when you're using Apple CarPlay, right? Because Apple CarPlay is designed to work seamlessly with Apple Maps. If you're hooking your phone up to your, you know, infotainment device via Apple CarPlay, and then you're trying to use Google Maps, it's you're you're trying to get like two things that are not designed to work well together, and they don't work that well together. If you have an iPhone and you're hooking your iPhone up to your car, and you're using your iPhone for directions, then using Apple CarPlay, then using Apple Maps is, ki especially in the United States, is kind of a no-brainer. That's like the easy win for Apple. And it is kind of astonishing that when they launched Apple Maps, they weren't winning on that. But now, now they've managed to get that down. I, I kind of buy that. My, my husband and I are in a mixed map marriage where <laughs> uh, he drives and I don't. And he prefers Apple Maps specifically because of that. Uh, and, and I'm so, uh, I think, locked into Google Maps that I use it primarily for walking directions and finding restaurants and things. So it has different value for me. Right. So that's, so that's the next thing, which is that while the design of Apple Maps is, I think, pretty much everyone can agree. It just looks nicer. It's cleaner. The colors are better. The fonts are better. Like it just, and, and when it does do those clever little like 3D things, they look better. Like everything is cleaner on Apple Maps than it is on Google Maps, partly because Apple isn't monetizing in the way that Google is, right? Google, if you call up a Google Map, it's going to show you a whole bunch of random places that are there because they're paying for that placement. Apple doesn't do that. And so there's just less sort of random cruft in the Apple Maps. But the thing that Google has that Apple doesn't is just the world's information. Google is an information company. Apple is not an information company. And if you just type, fire up your map app and say, like, you know, take me to the nearest Best Buy, the chances of Google knowing exactly where the nearest Best Buy is and the fact that the place where Apple thinks there's a Best Buy, in fact, that Best Buy closed down a year ago, but Apple hasn't updated its information. You know, Google has that information. Google knows what the opening hours are. Google knows what the phone number is. Google knows all of these things with much more accuracy than Apple does. With Apple, like, on some level, it's still more reliable to look up the address and then type in the address than it is, or look up the address on Google, you know, and then type in the address from Google into Apple Maps, because the database on Apple just isn't as extensive as the database in Google. Yeah, a lot of people said that we had one guy who was like, no, it's not even close. Obviously, Google is better. It's a search company. And that's the thing that matters most. And that's why they're just better. They have better data. End of story. Apple is not a data company in the way Google is. And other people were not wanting to give Google any more information about their lives. You know, there were a bunch of emails that were like, Apple, um, I already have my iPhone. Apple knows where I am and where I'm going. So let me just stick with one company knowing that as opposed to giving two companies a window into my life. And people trust people trust Apple that, uh, that Apple isn't going to sell that personal data in the way that Google is. I don't know whether that trust is well-placed or not. But Google has, for better or worse, like developed this reputation as this place where like they just monetize your information in a million different ways. And and Apple is like, no, we care much more about privacy. And so people feel safer in terms of like giving out their data when using Apple Maps. And I think that's reasonable. We had one listener who suggested that Apple Maps was better because it would produce more accurate alternate routes if there were, you know, traffic problems and stuff like that. And it reminded me of how revolutionary Waze seemed when it first came out. Mm. Uh, but I haven't, as a non-driver, I have no way of knowing whether Apple or Google is more competent at that. Well, so Google bought Waze, right? And 
it was always a little bit unclear the degree to which Waze was ever really incorporated into Google directions. But I think what's happened now is that Apple has reached critical mass. Enough drivers are using Apple Maps. Enough drivers are using Apple CarPlay that Apple has that information of who's stuck in traffic and who isn't. And so that advantage that Waze had of, you know, everyone being connected to Waze and Waze therefore knowing who was stuck in traffic, like that is no longer an advantage because they all have that now. Sometimes Google will reroute me and be like, we have rerouted you because of traffic. We have saved you two minutes. And I'm like, really? You didn't need to do that. Like, I don't need to go down some weird roads now because of two minutes. You know, sometimes the decisions are a little hard to understand. The the Apple Maps, I can't remember who it was sent in, like an incredibly specific, like Apple Apple Maps quirk. If you're driving south on the West Side Highway in Manhattan, and it always oh, right. asks you to take like a weird slip road before you hit 57th Street, and you're like, and I'm like, yep. Yep, that has happened to me. I don't know why Apple Maps <laughs> always does that, but they always ask you to do that. You just learn to ignore it. There are some quirks, and you kind of learn to live with the quirks just because the experience is better. But the one thing I will say is that Apple has invested an enormous amount of money into really improving its Maps product in the U.S., and there are a lot of countries in the world where it's quite obvious that it has not invested that kind of money. And, you know, for those of us who do occasionally leave the United States, we can find ourselves in countries where you open up Apple Maps and you're like, this is terrible. I have no idea. And then you open up Google Maps and it has huge amounts of granularity and shows you everything. And you're like, this isn't even close. Hmm. One thing I think is interesting about Apple Maps versus Google Maps is it shows so clearly how that botched launch of Apple Maps really screwed that app for so long. Like I deleted it for my phone. Like when I saw the news about, you know, the launch and we wrote about it back at HuffPost, I was like, well, I'm never using that. My goodness. And like that stuck with me for so long. And in the emails, you know, people said like, oh, I didn't use it because of the launch. I didn't use it because of the launch. Like it just really underscores how, how important product launches are, I guess, or some product launches, or I don't know what happened or why that product launch specifically was so damaging. You know, sometimes other products have rocky starts and they're fine, but this one. Yeah, no, it definitely had a terrible reputation. There was, it was an atrocious launch. And actually one of the things, one of the reasons why the launch was so atrocious is because Apple seems to, seemed to have optimized for people who lived in Cupertino. Like, it worked really <laughs> well for San Francisco, Cupertino, and probably Atherton. And then everywhere else, it was just ter terrible. And now it has managed to, like, expand its sphere of being actually good, you know, from the Bay Area to not just all of the United States, but, like, a large chunk of the rest of the world as well, including, you know, a lot, a lot of the UK and various other places. So... They've done a good job, but yeah, no, it, who, who goes back and checks, you know, you, you really need, this is why you need to listen to slate money people, because like, exactly. this is how you learn that you can reinstall <laughs> Apple maps. If you're one of those people like Emily who deletes it, I never delete any apps. I have like, you know, 400 apps on my phone, the vast, no. vast majority of which I never use. I don't see any harm in that, but, th but yeah, we were having all of these app minimalists writing in saying, if I don't use an app every day, I'm going to delete it. But how do you find anything on your on your phone if you have so many apps? Like I find I had to reorganize. You, you just know? swipe down and type in whatever you want to use. But that's, that's actually kind of annoying. That's like an extra step you're taking. Or you just ask Siri, Siri, open, open the Delta Airlines app. It'll find it. It's in there somewhere. No, I know. But that's just, you know, you're adding more steps to your life. I have a well curated homepage of the apps I use the most all on my home screen. But surely we all use more apps than fit onto our home screen. Surely. Oh, that's true. I guess. I tend to delete them though. If if I don't use them after like a year, I get rid of them. An interesting question would be what's the longest running <laughs> app that you refuse to delete from your phone even though you haven't used it in forever because you think it will come in handy one day. Ooh. Well that that's but that's the whole thing that I never need I never need to think about that. I have so many apps that I I don't even know that I have them. 
You guys, I got a new vacuum over Christmas. I know. Exciting. <laughs> and you down and it came with an app, right? And you're like, I need I need my vacuum app. Yeah, I downloaded the vacuum app. And like the next day I was like, why did I do this to myself? And it's not even I looked at the app in depth, okay? I spent at least four minutes on this app. And it's it's not worth it. I was just so excited about, you know, the vacuum and everything, but I'll probably not delete that's, it. That's that's exactly what I do. I I download the vacuum app. I maybe use it once. <laughs> I never use it again, and it just sits there in a large pile of apps I never use. No harm, no foul. And then that company, the vacuum company, is watching your every move. No, they're not because if you'd never open the app, <laughs> they have no idea. <laughs> we have to take a break, but we'll be back after this. At the start of the new year, every small business owner is asking themselves the same question. What's the one move I can make that'll take my business to the next level in 2024? LinkedIn Jobs knows that your success all depends on the team you surround yourself with. That's why LinkedIn Jobs has created the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals, which makes it the best place to hire. Hiring is easy when you have that many quality candidates. So easy, in fact, that 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn also knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire. Thankfully, with LinkedIn, the process is intuitive, quick, and easy. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash slate. That's linkedin.com slash slate to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that can earn 4.35% annual percentage yield when you open a savings account. A high yield, low effort way to grow your money with no fees. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone to start earning and growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, member FDIC. Terms apply. This episode of Slate Money is brought to you by Climatize, which is a solar investing platform. Solar power, of course, is a way to save money on your energy bills, but often, especially for businesses, the upfront cost of solar has made it almost impossible for business owners to invest in. That's where Climatize comes in. It allows investors like you to loan money to vetted businesses who want to go solar, and in exchange, you can earn up to 10% annually on your investment. Hundreds of investors have already invested over one and a half million dollars using Climatize, and you can get started with as little as ten dollars. Best of all, there are zero investor fees. To explore the solar investments available on the Climatize platform, go to climatize.earth slash slate. Investments carry financial risks and could lose money. Investments are illiquid. Okay, we don't talk about Bitcoin a lot on this show, but we should talk about it this week because Bitcoin is now a thing you can buy on the stock market. Elizabeth, why is this important? Is this important? Yes and no. Bitcoin is a thing you can buy on the stock market because now you can trade ETFs based on Bitcoin. And that means that it's being regarded by markets as kind of a store of value and not just an alternative currency. And so that, I think, legitimizes it more. So that's that's super interesting, right? This idea that it's a store of value rather than an alternative currency. I feel like that has been the case for a decade now. Like, it never took off as a currency. No one has ever used it as a currency. I'm about to win a bet with Ben Horowitz about like how no one ever uses it as a currency. Like this is a straw man. Like the whole history of Bitcoin has been store of value, number go up. I'm buying it because it's going to go up in value. Oh my god, it's worth forty five thousand dollars for one Bitcoin. Like that is what it's always been. So, like, what has changed? Well, Felix, what has changed is this week, the SEC approved Bitcoin ETFs, I believe 11 different ones. And that means that institutional 
money. That means that there's just going to be more money flowing in to Bitcoin because now it's easier to speculate, trade, and invest in Bitcoin because, you know, some people didn't want to go through Coinbase or FTX or figure out how to do it, you know, with your wallet or this or that. This makes it easy. This means you can go to your to your guy or your gal and you can say, let's do some some Bitcoin trading and your guy or your gal can be like, great, there are these ETFs. I can put some of your money in these Bitcoin ETFs now. Or probably more likely, your guy or your gal will come up to you and be like, hey, there are these Bitcoin ETFs now. You, it's really simple now. You can invest in in Bitcoin and you don't have to do anything weird or scary. And to be clear, there have been Bitcoin ETFs for about a year or so now, but they've been based on Bitcoin futures rather than Bitcoin spot. And I'm I don't entirely understand why Bitcoin Spot is such a big deal rather than Bitcoin Futures. But in any case, now you can buy an ETF based on Bitcoin Spot. So it was really interesting to kind of watch Gary Gensler, who's the head of the SEC, kind of like deal with what was happening. Because I guess the SEC had allowed these futures Bitcoin ETFs to go through. And then they got sued because they weren't letting the spot ETFs go through. And the argument was like, well, if you're letting us bet on futures, why can't we just bet on the actual thingy? And the SEC lost. So they had to, I guess, approve these, even though the chair, Gary Gensler, really seems to not have wanted to. And his quotes this week were kind of, I guess the word would be begrudging, disparaging. Yeah, his his statement his statement was kind of was kind of amazing. He's like, yeah, there was this court case. We kind of have to do it, but like this does not mean that we're cool with Bitcoin. We are not cool with Bitcoin people. I put his quote into a an Apple note because it's it's so so what he literally said, though we're merit neutral, I note that Bitcoin is primarily a speculative, volatile asset that's also used for illicit illicit activity, including ransomware money laundering, sanction evasion, and terrorist financing. Yeah, such like sour grapes, man. Like, <laughs> I didn't want to do this, but I had to do this. No, he, he clearly did not want to do it, but it has been done. There are now 11 of these beasts, all of them pretty much, I think, with the exception of GBTC, which is its own like special case, nearly all of the others launching with this sort of initial teaser rate of 0% fees in an attempt to become more attractive. And, you know, in this world of ETFs where there does seem to be a bunch of like winner takes all dynamics, everyone wants to be the one place where all the trading happens, where all the liquidity is. Um, And it's going to be really interesting to see whether any of them really get to that point, because I'm frankly skeptical. I think we could have all 11 stuck at zero fees for a long time and none of them really getting big. The reason Emily is related to exactly what you're saying, which is the individuals who've been into Bitcoin have been able to, you know, own their Bitcoins directly or own them via Coinbase or Robinhood or Cash App or anything else. And all of that is relatively easy. And they've been doing that for years. Institutions also have had a lot of institutional grade crypto trading functionality at their fingertips for years. The one area where it's been hard is what you were talking about, which is financial advisors, RIAs, wealth managers, private bankers, that kind of thing. They are much more comfortable just buying ETFs, but they move slowly. They're cautious. I don't think you're going to have like wake up, you know, next week and have a whole bunch of them picking up the phones and saying, I think you should buy Bitcoin. Also, given that there are 11 of these different ETFs to choose from, it's like, how do you pick which one? It's almost impossible to to pick one, to know which one is going to have the liquidity, to know which one is going to like work the best. And so that everyone's going to be in sort of like wait and see mode for a long time. And it's hard for me to see what the catalyst is that's going to get a whole bunch of wealth advisors to go, oh, yeah, you should buy this thing that has no dividend yield. It has, you know, no PE ratio. It has no way of valuing it. It's just a speculative vehicle. And I have no particular insight into why Bitcoin might go up or go down. But yeah, go ahead, throw 2% of your net worth into it. Like, as, as a registered investment advisor, it feels like a hard thing to recommend. I don't think they would recommend it organically. I think what would probably happen is that if you are a registered investment advisor, you sometimes have clients who come in and if they've, 
you know, been talked to by people who are big gold bugs. They say, how can I put money into precious metals? Or, or they've heard about Bitcoin and they say, how can I put money safely into Bitcoin? And, and there's some demand for it, I think, from consumers. I don't think that, you know, the, the investment advisors are recommending it organically. I think the other thing is zooming out. I think this really, the the SEC approving these things is a a pretty remarkable triumph for crypto. It really is. I think it, despite Gary Gensler's, you know, curmudgeonly remarks, I think it just lends an aura of legitimacy to crypto and to Bitcoin that it didn't have before. And it's it's pretty remarkable, especially considering what happened last year in, in this quote unquote asset class, right? Well, the Winklevire vindicated, you know, they, they applied for, <laughs> they, they want ETFs to exist in 2013 and now they do. Yeah. Winkle vindication. It could wind up being a bit of a Pyrrhic victory for them in that, you know, they get their Bitcoin ETF along with 10 other ones that are all trading at the same time and they don't have, you know, they find it basically impossible to get to critical mass. There's this constant competition in terms of fees that makes it impossible for them to turn a profit on this and the whole thing you know becomes this kind of like why did we even bother time will tell felix oh for fuck's sake <laughs> <laughs> well okay so this is so this is an interesting question emily since in, in the mind space of, of long-term bets it's 2024 when my um long, my second long-term bet five-year bet with ben horowitz is coming up soon this will happen on the pod later this year how much time do you think it's going to take before time tells? And what do you think the sort of criterion is going to be in terms of like, this was a big deal and it made a difference versus like, this was a massive nothing burger? Oh, that's good. That's that's tough. I think we're watching the price of Bitcoin. I think these ETFs were priced into the price of Bitcoin. So it'll take a little bit of time, but I think if we see sort of a, a sustained uptick in Bitcoin prices, that would be a, a good indicator that these things made a difference. And I guess we'll be tracking how much money flows into each of the ETFs. Maybe there'll be a clear winner in terms of just flows, investor flows. I don't know. So the, those would be the two indicators I would think that you would look at. Let's say in a year's time, do you think that more than 5% of total Bitcoin market cap is going to be in ETFs? Yeah. Okay, I'll take the under. We'll, 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 have, we'll, we'll have that bet. Oh, are we betting? Oh, God. What could we bet that, that Felix would care about that's low stakes? You know what? Your, your uh, Zerucci coffee... A Zojirushi coffee mug. Oh, what about Felix has to do the morning shift at Axios for a week? I could take my morning <laughs> shift for five days. There you go. I would like that. And what do you? What do I get if I win? I don't know. All right, we will we will negotiate this <laughs> offline and come and come back next week with the stakes for this bet. But at least we have the terms of it, which is in a year's time, if you add up the assets under management in these eleven Bitcoin ETFs. Does it come to more than 5% of Bitcoin's total market cap? I'm really nervous. <laughs> um, should we have a numbers round? Okay. Okay. Emily, what's yours? Mine is 19.6. That is a percentage. That is the U.S. office vacancy rate, 19.6%. And it is at a record high going back to 1980. Or no, going back to 1979. Um, offices are empty, you guys. They have not recovered from everyone going home in 2020. People are still at home. And um, I wrote about it this week. And it's actually kind of interesting. Offices aren't just vacant because of COVID. They're also vacant because in the 80s, the 1980s in the US, we built too many offices. And the markets never really come back from that. We've always had sort of this office glut in the United States and other that other countries really don't have. So when offices emptied out for COVID-19, that was like an additional complication, a stress factor that we're seeing in the US, especially in the South, that other countries really aren't seeing, which I didn't know. Credit to the Wall Street Journal for pointing this out. Elizabeth? Okay, my number is two hundred fifty thousand, and that's dollars. Uh, and because I have a thing for crazy rich people things, 
Uh, that's the amount of money that you pay for a so-called golden passport to St. Kitts, where if you're incredibly wealthy, you can store your money at great tax advantage. Uh, but you can also have a passport to St. Kitts uh, for that amount of money. And that accounts for 51% of the country's revenue. And it's regarded as a citizenship by investment passport. So there are several countries, you know, I think Anguilla also has one of these, but it's more like $100,000 where you can have dual citizenship. The European ones are much more, if you want to, if you want to get like Malta or Cyprus or something like that, the, you know, these are bargains in comparison. Why would you want that? Why, why, why would you want another passport? I mean... Yeah, if you're an American. Oh, if you're an American? No, I don't think it's mostly Americans. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, no, well, then is, I understand. <laughs> yeah, having like in fact, Americans are the one nationality who it isn't, because Americans have to pay tax on their global income, no matter where they live. Uh, whereas, if you are a citizen of anywhere else on the planet, if you leave that country, then you don't need to pay tax in that country. Wait, so the play is you're a really rich British guy, and then you get one of these two hundred fifty thousand dollar passports, become a citizen of a different country, and then you don't have to pay taxes in uk anymore well no well, you in fact to not pay taxes in the uk you just need to leave the uk you don't even need a passport somewhere else so then why you need the passport the passport just helps you like getting around the planet if you have a you know a, a passport from chad then trying to get visas to go around to f- fly around the planet and to visit the, the United States and all of that kind of stuff is really hard. Mm, okay. But the United States finds doesn't mind people from St. Kitts. But also, I think you, in, in this case, you, you actually, I mean, it is literally called citizenship by investment. You, you do have citizenship in St. Kitts. So you could ostensibly domicile yourself there and then be subject to no taxes. Yeah, but you, but presumably you can domicile yourself there even if you're not a citizen. The people who are buying the St. Kitts citizenship are not giving up their native country citizenship. They're just getting an extra one, which makes it easier for them to hop over to America. And it might make it easier for them to have you know permanent residence in St. Kitts and thereby pay taxes or not pay taxes in St. Kitts. Yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. I think you know a lot of people sort of game that system where you have a house in St. Kitts and you can establish that you're there for X number of days a year, and then you're resident of St. Kitts and not the U.S. No, absolutely. But like the the residency requirements, like you know, it might be easier to get residency if you're a citizen, so that might be part of it for sure. I guess if you're an American, you don't do that. You just like have a house in Florida or something. Yeah, and then you and then you spend more than 180 d- days a year in Florida, and then you, yeah, don't need to pay state income tax. Exactly. I read that New Yorker article. My number is eight, which is the percentage of ESG resolutions that BlackRock voted for in 2023, which is down from 40 percent in 2021. And this is a similar decline to what we're seeing at the other big American fund managers, whether it's Vanguard or Fidelity or State Street, um, even the ones owned by even Pioneer Funds, which is owned by Amundi, which is the big European asset manager. All of them voted for many, many fewer ESG resolutions in 2023 than they did in 2021. Whereas if you look at the European fund managers and ISS and the proxy vote advisors and all of that, they, they've they been holding steady. And I find this fascinating as a sign of basically an implicit sign. You, it's, it's not There's not clear causality, but there's implied causality with the ESG backlash and Vivek Ramaswamy and all of that kind of stuff that they, they don't want to be necessarily associated with this idea of woke capitalism. And so they're voting for these things much less than they used to. Yeah. Environmental, social, and governance. That's what ESG stands for. And it used to be a great PR move for companies to do and say, we're into ESG and BlackRock was super into ESG. And now um, people like Vivek Ramaswamy and uh, and Elon and that whole jam, various Republican governors have turned ESG into this like very toxic term. So now it's not useful for publicity anymore. Now it's the exact opposite. But what's fascinating is if you phone up BlackRock or Vanguard or anyone else and say, like, is this why? 
are you voting for these things less often because of Vivek? They'll be like, hell no. Yeah, they have no effect on our voting whatsoever. It's because the nature of the resolutions have changed. They're more political now. Or, you know, the, the, the company has changed. They've already achieved everything we're asking them to, to achieve. So we don't need to vote for it anymore and all of these kind of things. And it's it's fascinating that, like, while they're happy to change their voting record, what they're never happy to do is to admit that there might be any kind of, you know, outside influence on it. Anyway, I think that's it for us this week, unless you're a Slate Plus member, in which case you will get to listen to us talk about Bill Ackman, who is another one of those people who, with strong views about ESG and DEI and things like that. Thanks for listening. Thanks for writing in on Slate Money at Slate.com. And thanks to Jared Downing and Merritt Jacob for producing Late at Night on Friday night. And we'll be back next week with more Slate Money. <laughs>